Okay, I will make a small introduction and I will take a, as little time as possible between such an interesting speaker and the theme and the audience just to, to welcome you all today in this room. So it's great that we are getting back to normal and the new generation of, of students has also this possibility to uh, be at the lectures of such outstanding speakers. I, I see an older generation also, <laughs> which is getting back to alma mater for such interesting things. That's all great, and the best thing is that we have Yaron Brook today with us. It's as we have now rediscovered, so it's the third time he is visiting uh, our university and sharing his precious time with us. So Jarn is um, chair of the board of Einrand Institute. Before that, he was uh, executive Director, yeah. yeah. So actually, the last time you were in that capacity here, or or whatever, it's not, not that important. important. Yeah. So <laughs> he he's PhD in finance, uh, businessman, activist, author of a uh, number of books. So as a speaker, you you will appreciate him quite soon, in a couple of minutes. And uh, what I, if I can believe the Wikipedia, <laughs> he's converted socialist, so. Long time at ago. Least, at least, long, a, long, 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 as a teenager, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but still this, I mean, it's an interesting journey, which goes through, and we are maybe, possibly also like myself, we are, hundreds of thousands uh, who converted through through one book from one side of the island to the other side of the island so which is the atlas Schracht. so welcome back thank you thank you and floor is yours thank you thank you uh it's great to be back in georgia and in particular great to be back uh here at uh at free university it's always been a, a real pleasure so we're here to discuss capitalism. And capitalism is the system. It's a system of freedom, of free markets. We kind of all recognize uh, you know, the differences between capitalism and a controlled economy, whether it's a socialist economy or whether it's some other form of statism, state control, central planning. And there's this contrast between capitalism and everything else. And one of the interesting phenomena, I think one of the fascinating things that happen in the world in which we all live, is the fact that capitalism has been an unbelievable success story. Capitalism, everywhere it's tried, to the extent that it is tried, is successful. If what you care about in terms of success is human well-being, wealth creation, quality of life, standard of living, uh, longevity. If you care about human well-being, then capitalism dominates any other system. It just does. And all you need are eyes to see it. We've run experiments. For 100 years, experiments in socialism, experiments in fascism, experiments in mixtures, in some elements of freedom, some elements of statism. And the results are in. They've been in for a long time. The more controlled, the more statist, the more central planning, the poorer you become the more people die, the less fun life is. And the more economic freedom, the more 
ability of entrepreneurs to create businesses and to build and create, the less the government intervenes, the less the government controls, the richer people get. The more fun life is. I mean, you can see this uh, all over the world. You can see this in, uh, you know, there's a satellite picture, a famous satellite picture of North and South Korea. If you've seen this, like you, you get this picture and North Korea at night on satellite is dark. There are no lights because there's no electricity. There's not enough money for electricity. They're not wealthy enough to have electricity. So it's dark. And people are living, you can imagine, living in that place in darkness, just like human beings have lived 300, 400, 500 years ago, before we had electricity. In North Korea in the 21st century, they still live like that. Siri doesn't agree with me, obviously. Uh, South Korea, on the other hand, same place, South Korea, all lit up. Full of lights, the whole peninsula. They're rich, they're successful, people have lives, people have electricity, which is a symbol of successful living. They don't, oh, stop it, Siri. All right, we'll turn her off. You see that contrast, and what's interesting, I didn't even know this, but if you look back, and you look at, you know, there was a big war in Korea in the 1950s. There was a Korean War uh, between the South and the North. And when the war ended, the South was poorer than the North. And yet today the South is dramatically richer. Why? Well, the North is completely state-controlled. No freedom. No capitalism. The South is relatively free. Is it completely capitalist like I would like it to be? No. No place on earth is. We'll get to that. Okay. But it's much freer. So the more, the closer you get to an ideal of free markets, an ideal of no state intervention in the economy, the richer you get. You can see that in South and North Korea. We could see that during the, during the, uh, the time of the Soviet Union, the difference. So capitalism works wherever and to the extent that it is tried. If you look at the Economic Freedom Index, which is an index that is published that ranks countries based on how free they are economically, there is a correlation, a relationship between freedom and wealth and success and development of technology and entrepreneurship and all the things that we value. And the most important, I think, illustration of this is an historic one. We don't have a blackboard here, but we'll draw in the air, right? So this is time. We're drawing over time. That's, oh, we've got a whiteboard. That's fine. That's fine. I'll draw on time. We're, we're fine in the, drawing in the air. All right. So this is 100,000 years ago, right here. And this is a graph of wealth or income per capita. And for 100,000 years, nothing happened. We were just as rich, just as poor as before. So when you were born, you had stuff. And when you died, you had the same stuff. No growth. And the population of the earth didn't grow. It was basically flat. We had nothing. We got up in the morning and went to work in the field. We came home when the sun set and we went to sleep because there was no light. Remember North Korea, no light. Nobody could read. What was a life expectancy? For most of human history, life expectancy has been in the 30s. We're all dead up here. Some of you are still middle-aged, right? If you're in your 20s, you're already towards the end. I mean, it's hard for us to imagine that, to plan a horizon that's so short. 50% of all children die before the age of 10. Women frequently die during childbirth. I mean, that was life for 100,000 years, and it just was. There was no income was about $2 a day what the UN today defines as extreme poverty. We were extremely poor, all of us. 90 plus percent, 95 plus percent of humanity was extremely poor. And then suddenly, 
out of nowhere. We become rich. I had to jump to get to where we are, right? Wealth goes up. Income goes up. Life expectancy goes up. Child mortality goes down. Health goes up. By every measure of human success, of human well-being, gets better. What happens to make that? To me, the most important question in the humanities, the most important question in history, in economics, in sociology, in any one of these fields, is what happened to go from nothing, life just sucks for 100,000 years, that's a long time, to wow, we can do anything. We can go to the moon. We can go to Mars, if you believe Elon Musk, right? Just goes like this. And by, in, in monetary terms, we're today 300 times richer than we were back then, 300 times. But in real terms, we're much, 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 much richer than that. Why? Because how do you put a number, a dollar amount, on running water, on having toilets, the value of that? How do you put a monetary amount on having electricity? So we're thousands of times better today than we were back then. So what happened suddenly to make this change? What changed about human life to make it possible suddenly for us to grow and to become rich, to become wealthy, and to have everything that we have today? Anybody, anybody have a date when that happened, about when that happened? When did that change happen? Guess. Beginning of the 18th century, so 17 something. Anybody else? It actually happens at the end of the 17th century. I like one day, you know, because I, I live in America. I like 1776. It's somewhat arbitrary. You could, you could have it any time during that period, but three important things happened in 1776. Three important things. One, the steam engine, steam engine is commercialized for the first time. It's for the first time put into commercial practice. And you could argue that that is the beginning of an industrial revolution. The beginning of using machines to replace human beings to do manual labor, which increases productivity and makes it possible to have abundance of material things. Second thing that happens in 1776, a famous book is published. Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, the first real economic elaboration of the virtues of markets, of capitalism, of how markets work. And that influences the thinking of a whole generation. And the third thing that happens in 1776, famous political document written, the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America. And that to me is the most important one because, not because it starts America, but because it defines certain ideas that are common during that period. And what are those ideas? Even though they didn't live up to them, that we're all, in a sense, equal. Not equal in outcome, not equal in who we are. Just look around the room. We're not all equal. We're all different, which is cool and great, the fact that we're different. But in what sense are we all, should we all be equal? Well, even opportunity is tricky, right? Because we're never going to be equal in real opportunities, right? Some of us are born with parents who know a lot of people who maybe spend a lot of effort on our education. We have different opportunities. If somebody is unlucky, born with parents who are not, you know, that connected or invest that much in their education or whatever, right? So we're not going to have equal opportunities. So in what sense are we equal? Rights. Right. We're equal in our freedoms. We're equal in our liberties. We're equal before the law. Because remember, during this period, if you're an aristocrat and you're a peasant and you commit a crime, are you treated the same by the law? No, aristocrats are treated much better than a peasant. Aristocrat can get away with anything. So America says, no, we're all equal before the law. We all are free. We all have rights. And what rights do we have? We have a right to our life, our own life, to live it as we see fit, based on our own judgment. We have a right to liberty, to speak, to write, to communicate. Nope. And we have a right to what? Pursue happiness. To try to attain our own 
Happiness. And what does rights mean? What does right mean? Rights mean freedom. Freedom from coercion, freedom from force, freedom from authority. It means you get to decide. Fundamentally, the Declaration of Independence is about one thing. It says every one of us as an individual is free to make decisions about our own life. Nobody can tell us how to live. Nobody can tell us what to do. Nobody can tell us what's right or what's wrong. We have to figure it out. We have to choose. It's our responsibility and it's our right to do so. In other words, we as individuals are free from coercion, from interference, from authority dictating to us. We get to use our mind, our reason, to figure out what's true and what's not, what's good for us and what's not, and then pursue the values we choose for ourselves with the goal being our happiness. That's a revolution. The revolution is not so much the political system that is America, though that's pretty much a revolution too, but it's the idea that we all have the freedom to pursue our happiness because before that, who did your life belong to? The government, the tribe, the state, the king, the leader, the church, somebody else. Your life wasn't yours to live. Your choices, your values weren't yours to pursue. It wasn't about pursuing your happiness. It was about pursuing the good of the state, the good of the tribe, the good of the church, the good of something else, not you. So the revolution that the late 17th century brings to us is an intellectual, philosophical, moral, ethical revolution that says you are all free to pursue your values for the sake of your happiness, using your mind, using your reason. And what happens? Well, suddenly people go, whoa, cool. I can do what I want to do? You mean I can start this business and I don't have to ask permission? I don't have to get the king's approval? I can trade with other people based on my own values? I can choose my own profession? Who chose your profession before that? Well, if you're a woman, no professions. Fact, right? Nothing. If you're a man, what profession did you have? What did your father had? There was a guild system. You became what your father became. There's an a, there's a interesting story. You know, you're Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, a, a genius, one of the great geniuses of history. And he did lots of different things. He was, a, he was a sculptor and a painter and an engineer and a strategist and an advisor. He did lots of different things. And the question is, how come? Because his father was a notary. A notary is like a, a, a you know, approved signatures, right? Why didn't he become a notary? He's supposed to join the guild. So how come Leonardo da Vinci had this amazing life? What we call, when we say Renaissance man, we mean like a, a Leonardo. How come, how come he didn't become a notary? Why didn't he follow his father's thing? But you know, it's really cool. Because he was an illegitimate son. He was born out of wedlock. That is, he was, his father had an affair with a woman. And he had a, he, 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 so because he was illegitimate, he was free in this realm. If he'd been a legitimate son, we would have lost Leonardo da Vinci, right? Because he would have become a boring notary. Nothing against notaries, but you know, it's kind of boring. Did you marry who you wanted back then? No, everything was arranged. Did you get to choose really anything about your life? No. And if you wanted to do something new, something different, you had to get permission. It was a permission society. And what the Declaration of Independence does, why it's an important document, not just for America, but for the whole world, is it basically says, you don't need permission. Go live your life. Go do what you want. Nobody has a right to tell you to stop. Nobody has a right to put barriers in front of you. As long as you're not hurting other people, you're not, not violating other people's rights. Go live. And this results in an explosion of entrepreneurship. 
an explosion of migration. People starting to move. Hey, I don't need to be, live where I was born. I can go where my life can be better. I don't need to do what my father said, did. I can do what I want to do. And this explosion of freedom is what resulted in the wealth that we have today. So an important question we have to ask is why, if capitalism is so good, why if capitalism has been so successful over the last 100, 200 years really, 200 years, 250 years, why do almost all of us hate it? Because almost everywhere, in almost every country, including in Georgia, we move away from capitalism. We move away from freedom. We want the state to regulate and control. And, and every time we do that, things don't, just, don't get better, but we keep going. We keep voting in people who are going to limit capitalism, limit markets, limit our freedoms. And we're okay with that. What is it about capitalism that we so hate and resent? What is it about markets that we don't trust? Why, if capitalism is so successful, if freedom is so successful, does the whole world, it seems to me right now, moving away from freedom, away from capitalism? In every area, we've got more and more and more state control. Why? Well, perceived inequality, but why is inequality so important? What is it about inequality we don't like? How do people get rich? How do you become a billionaire? Anybody know how you become a billionaire? How do you become a billionaire? You can inherit it. How many of the billionaires in the world today inherited their billions? Very few. Very few. If you look at the top list of billionaires in, in a place like America at least, Almost none of them inherited their billions, right? Elon Musk did not inherit his billions. Jeff Bezos did not inherit his billions. Bill Gates did not inherit his billions. How did they become billionaires? They make something that people want to pay for. Yeah, they make something that a lot of people want and appreciate. And they're willing to pay more than it costs to produce. And they're willing to pay over and over and over again for it. Now, why are people willing to pay over and over and over again for these products that these people make? Why? Because what? The improved version. But why? So I pay, I like to use my iPhones. I paid $1,000 for this. Why? $1,000. It's a lot of money. Why did I pay $1,000 for this? Because it's worth more to me than $1,000 much more to me than a thousand dollars. I mean, you guys are born with this, you, can't, you don't remember life without these things. So you don't appreciate them because it's just second nature to you. But I remember when to call my family when I was traveling would cost a fortune, so you never called your family. When I, when I, I, I was born and raised in Israel, and I left Israel and went to the United States, and when I came to the United States, I never called my parents. My parents lived in Israel and I lived in America. I would call them once every three months because it cost a fortune. Long distance telephone calls cost a fortune. So once every three months, I'd call them for like two, three minutes. Now, you can call, I can call my kids from anywhere in the world, read them a bedtime story by video, and it costs me what? Nothing. I mean, that's pretty amazing, just that. I remember driving with maps, real maps, not Google Maps, right? Paper maps. I remember playing records, vinyl. Some of you still probably do for some bizarre reason. Um, but now I have access to every piece of music ever written in all of human history. I can access it immediately, anywhere, anytime, at a marginal cost of zero. And you could go on and on. In terms of this is, I mean, when we have a question and we're not sure about something, what do you do? You Google it. I mean, that's a new term. Maybe 15 years old, Google it, right? But I have access to all of human knowledge right here, pretty much, right? Some, some fake news as well, but a lot of real truth right here, accessible to me. So this thing is worth a 
Now it turns on again. That's not good. A huge amount. It's worth to me. So I paid for this $1,000 because it's worth more than $1,000 to me. The only way billionaires can make billions in a free market is by creating something that people are willing to pay for. Why are they willing to pay for it? Because they think it's worth more than they're paying. Which means the only way you can become a billionaire is by creating stuff that makes people's lives better. Otherwise, they wouldn't buy it. And the difference between a millionaire and a billionaire is how much better you're making people's lives. The more money you make, it means the more, in a free market, the more you're making people's lives better. Jeff Bezos has changed the world. I don't know how we'd have survived COVID without Amazon. And now we take it for granted that we can just order stuff online and it just arrives at our place, right? It, that never used to be the case. iPhones, you know, you guys forgot about the revolution that was Microsoft and little, you know, home computers. I still remember when computers filled the room. And today my iPhone is more powerful than the computers that filled whole rooms, 1970s. So, billionaires create stuff that makes the world better. So why do we hate them? Because we hate them. There's no question we hate them. Why do we hate them? Because we want to be like them. Well, there's a way to be like I mean, you don't hate what you want to be like. The other way around, right? We envy them. We want to see them knocked down. It's not like we want to rise up. I mean, we'd like to, but we're not doing always what it takes to rise up. Instead, we bitch and complain and want to knock them down. And we love it when they do something bad so we can watch them fail. But there's something wrong about all of that. What is it about capitalism, about billionaires, about entrepreneurs that our culture dislikes? What are they doing? They're not giving enough back. Well, even just the language that you use. He said they're not giving enough back. Why would you give back anything? What did you take? Billionaires add. They don't take. They add value. They make the world a better place. Otherwise, they couldn't become billionaires because otherwise we wouldn't buy their stuff. And if we don't buy their stuff, they don't become billionaires. So the whole language of giving back assumes what? Assumes they took something. But they didn't. They created. And one of the big misunderstandings in the world in which we live is that we think... We think that wealth is a zero-sum game. That if I make something, you must have lost something. But that's not true. Wealth is cumulative. We're so much more richer today than we were 50 years ago, 100 years ago. We didn't take it from anybody. We created. Wealth is something you create. An iPhone didn't exist, and yet it was created. And by creating an iPhone, you created wealth. You created human well-being. You created something that didn't exist before. So a lot of the problem is that people have a perception of zero sum. My gaining is your loss. But life is not zero sum. You can see it every single day out there. People gain. They become better off, not worse off. What else is there about billionaires that we don't like? What are they pursuing? What's that? They make us spend money. Anybody here not like spending money? I think we all love spending money. The, one, the easiest thing in economics is to create consumption. Who doesn't like to consume? It's production that's hard. Consumption is easy. Whose values are they pursuing? Whose well-being are they trying to promote? Their selves. Businessmen are what? Yeah, they're selfish, they're self-interested. They're trying to make more money for whom? For themselves. Now, they happen to make all of our lives better, I think. But in the end, what motivates them? Why did Steve Jobs build an iPhone? To make me, my life better? Not really. He didn't think, oh, Iran, I, I need to make Iran's life better. Let me figure out how to make Iran's or your life better or anybody's. No, Steve Jobs built this because he loved to, because he enjoyed it, and because he made a lot of money doing it. He didn't do it for me. He did it for Steve Jobs. 
when, when you become an entrepreneur and you go and you work hard and you, you put your soul into the business and you do everything for that business, you're doing it for whom? At the end of the day, you're doing it for you because you love it. It's not just about money. Being self-interested is not just about money. It's about the fun of it. It's about the vision. It's about the beauty. It's about the challenge. It's about making your life better. So entrepreneurs, capitalism generally, is about people pursuing their own self-interest. And sadly, we live in a world in which self-interest is viewed as selfish, which is just another word for self-interest, right? But as bad. And, and just the idea of selfish equals bad. But what does selfish mean if you just take, a, take apart the word? It means focus on self. It means, in a sense, making your life the best that it can be. Why is that bad? Well, because we live with a code of ethics that says the purpose of morality, the purpose of life is to sacrifice. It's to live for other people. And one of the things Ayn Rand does, if you read Atlas Shrugged, if you read any of her books, one of the, is she asked why? Why should you live for other people? Why shouldn't you live for your own happiness, for your own success, for your own well-being? And why should you sacrifice? Why should you suffer? Why is that morally noble versus living for yourself by creating, building, making, by trading with others and pursuing your values to make your life the best life that it can be? Don't you? We have one life on this earth. And every second we live on this earth, we'll never get again. Why not make the most of that time that we have. Live the best life that we can while we're living it. And the way to do that is how, how would you live a good life? What's the tool we have as human beings to live a good life? Education. education. But even before education, what do you need in order to, what do you need to do in order to become educated? What do we need to do as human beings to gain any value? Work, but even work, you don't have the, the gene for work. You don't have the gene for studying. You have to do something. What makes us human beings? What, what's the difference between us and animals? We have to think. See, animals, they know exactly how to function in the world. It's all programmed into their DNA. They have no choices. Everything they do is pre-assigned, predetermined. Human beings... Anybody here a gene for hunting? You don't. You don't know how to hunt. I mean, some of you know how to hunt, but that's because you learned how to hunt. We don't have a gene for agriculture. Nobody's born with the knowledge of how to do agriculture. Nobody's born with the knowledge of how to, find, you know, how to grow food or how to find food. I mean, you try, what's a big animal in Georgia? Is there any big animals out there? A bear. Yeah. Right? Go try hunting a bear with your bare arms and just you by yourself without thinking. The bear will slaughter you. You don't have a chance. And yet, we're here in a very comfortable setting, and I'm sure there are more human beings in Georgia than there are bears, and you guys won the battle between you and the bears. How did you do that? By using your minds, by developing strategies, tools, weapons, by working together to hunt so human beings survive by their reason, by their mind. Human beings survive by using their mind to solve problems. And it is the human mind that makes us human. It's the mind that makes us human. It's our ability to reason that makes us human. So if you want to live the best life that you can live, it's the mind that you have to cultivate. It's reason you have to cultivate. It's thinking you have to get really, really good at. That's what it means to be self-interested. And capitalism is an expression of that because what do entrepreneurs do? They solve problems. How? By instinct? They don't have an instinct. We don't have an instinct to create an iPhone. They think about problems and they solve it and they use creativity and ingenuity in order to come up with new ideas and new solutions and new ways to do things that nobody else could imagine. And by doing that, they improve human life. And they improve their own life by making money. And there are 
appropriate response from us should be, wow, cool, thank you, that's amazing. But we still have this moral code that tells us that what's really good and virtuous and noble and wonderful is sacrifice and suffering and poverty. Poverty is noble somehow. No, it's not. What's noble is to live the best life that you can. So we have a moral conflict. And to me, the problem, the thing we have to do in order to promote capitalism, if we want capitalism, if you want to be wealthy, if you want to be successful at living, we need to challenge our ethical beliefs about self-interest, about whether it's good or bad. And Ayn Rand, again, would say, of course it's good. What else is there other than your life? So I encourage you all to read Rand, to read Alice Shrugged. It's a it can be a life-changing book. I think it's in Georgian, right? We have it in Georgian. We have a lot of Ayn Rand books in Georgian, so there are no, no excuses, if you will. It gives you, and I think the reason it changed our lives is not because it made some economic argument. The reason it changes so many lives is it because it makes a moral argument. It makes a moral argument about the nobility of living a good life in pursuit of your own happiness. And it's linked to that document in 1776. You have a right to pursue your life, your liberty, your own happiness, your own self-interest, your own well-being. And when individuals do that, when individuals go out there into the world to live the best life they can for themselves, what happens? They don't cheat, lie, steal. What do they do with one another? What's the way in which we interact with one another? We trade. And trade is win-win. I benefit from buying the iPhone. Apple benefits from buying it, from the fact that I bought the iPhone. Nobody lost. It's win-win. So the appropriate way for human beings to interact with one another is through trade, in pursuit of their own values, in pursuit of their own happiness. And the beneficiary of that kind of system is really everybody. We all benefit. And yes, there's inequality. But the response to inequality, if it's a result of just freedom, is who cares? Some people get rich because they produce more. Some people produce less, so they don't get quite as rich. Some of us choose to be teachers. Hard to make a lot of money as a teacher. We're smart, we can make money doing something else. Why do we choose to, make, why do we choose to become teachers? Yeah, it makes me happy. It's fun. I'm willing to give up millions of dollars to teach. I did give up millions of dollars to teach. Could have gone to Wall Street. Life is not about money. It's funny that I think it's, the, it's, it's socialists who seem to think that life is all about money. Capitalists don't think life is all about money. Life is all about doing the things you love to do and having the freedom to do that. And yes, money is necessary for that, but money, it's not all about money. And some people want to be entrepreneurs. Some people want to make a lot of money. Some people want to make enough money to be able to live, but it, interested in doing a profession that will never make the money. There are artists, there are teachers, there are lots of professions out there where it's hard to make a lot of money. So what we need is freedom. What we need is the ability to use our mind to solve problems for ourselves, for our companies, for people around us. We need the freedom to not have to ask permission to do what we believe is right. We need the freedom to live. And if we all had that freedom, we'd be a lot richer than we are today. And the path forward towards capitalism is a path that requires us to accept, to embrace the idea that pursuing one's self-interest is a good thing, not a bad thing. Living for oneself is a good thing, not a bad thing, if one is using reason, the mind, and one not exploiting other people. Thank you all. We'll take questions about anything. Don't be shy.
Hi. Is this on? Yeah, I think it's on. Okay, so first of all, thank you. Uh, um, I've read Rand's books, Atlas Shrugged as well, um, and uh, I've inquired about her I ideology, or I don't know what you call it, objectivism, right? Yep. Uh, so there's one thing that I did that didn't quite sit right with me, okay. and that was uh, that if the, if a socialist country like North Korea exists, uh, that tramps all over human rights, then another state has a right to go to war with that country, right? Uh, um, but that would obviously require a lot of money that you would have to take from people <laughs> to go to war with North Korea, for example. Yeah. Which means plunder, taxa taxation, right? Yeah. A lot of money, so. Well, not necessarily, but we'll get to that, yeah. Okay, yeah, so how, how does that work? <laughs> So the idea is, I, I mean, it's an interpretation of what you read from Rand, which I don't think is quite right, is that a country like North Korea, which tramples on its own citizens, uh, therefore any country has a right to invade it and take it over and replace it. And I think that's absolutely right. That is, in my view, an authoritarian regime that does not respect the rights of its own citizens has no right to exist. It's not legitimate. It's not sovereign. And therefore, if somebody invades them in the name of freedom, that's okay. But the real question is, why should anybody invade them? And, you know, why is it in my self-interest to send my kids to fight a war in North Korea to liberate the North Koreans, right? Uh, and pay the money and, make, the money, but what about the lives of people who are actually going to get, uh, so, to say that a country, you have a right to invade a country, is not to say that you should invade that country. You shouldn't, right? So in my view, government, under capitalism, government has only one function, one job. It's not to make the world free. <laughs> it's to protect your own citizens. The only job of government is to protect the lives and property of its own citizens. It means that a government should have a police force to protect you from criminals and fraudsters and people who are trying to violate your rights and trying to hurt, hurt you. And it should have a military to protect you from people invading you, people are trying to hurt you, terrorists or other countries. Or, and it should have a judiciary to help arbitrate disputes that we might have among us. But other than that, the government doesn't have any other function. So invading some country because you, because you have a right to do it you're not going to do it because it's a violation of your own citizens' rights. The government then is not acting to protect you, it's acting to protect... Now, if South Korea invaded North Korea, you would argue it's to eliminate a threat on their border. I don't know if you know, you know uh, uh, the cannons of North Korea are within firing distance of Seoul, where, I don't know, 15 million people or 20 million people live in this one city. So you could imagine a scenario in which South Korea had an incentive to do it. But America or somebody, Georgia invading South, I mean, no, right? Your government is to protect your rights, not to protect somebody else's rights. Now, how do you fund it? You, you should never fund these kind of things um, coercively. So all funding of government should be in one way or another voluntary. So one way in which you make sure you don't engage in unpopular wars is you can only engage in wars that the citizenry is willing to fund. And if the citizenry is not willing, that's why I believe in only volunteer, uh, only volunteer armies. Like I come from Israel, I served three years in the Israeli army because I was drafted. You had no choice, right? My wife served two years. Women served two, men served three years, and everybody does it. But in my view, that's immoral, that's wrong, that's use of coercion on its, your own population. And people say, but Israel wouldn't exist if you didn't have a draft army. And my answer to that is, if you can't raise a volunteer army to defend yourself, you shouldn't exist. Right? If you're not willing to fight for your own country, then it's not worth fighting for. Who you, who, what's the country there for if not for the people? And the people there should volunteer to fight for it. And if they're not willing to, it doesn't give them a right to force me to fight for them. So everything has to be voluntary. If it's voluntary, you limit the number of, quote, bad wars, right? Wars that people don't like. Can I ask another question? Sure. 
Okay. Uh, so what would your ideal taxation system be? Or like, you are not anarcho-capitalist, right? I'm not, a, I'm not an anarchist, okay. uh, no. I believe in government. I believe, again, in limited government that protects individual rights, and that's all it does. I believe in a separation between economics and state. The government has no role in economics. We can arrange everything economically through voluntary transactions and through trade. Um, how do you fund a government? Well, my main response to that is the same as Ayn Rand's, which is, I've got a lot, we've got a lot of time to worry about that question and answer, figure out how to answer that question, because right now, we're paying huge amounts of money for taxation. If only we could reduce it, that would be cool. How do we ultimately fund it? In some voluntary way. Uh, I think the, the primary voluntary way is people writing checks for the government in a voluntary way. And if you don't write a check, like the government would publish the list of everybody who paid into the system. And if you didn't, there'd be some social pressure on you to do so, uh, but no coercion. So, and again, if you can't raise enough money to fund a government, well, maybe the government shouldn't exist. Maybe you don't deserve it. Right? So again, I, I like voluntary. I like incentives. I like people to be incentivized to do what is right for them and not to coerce them and force them into doing things. Thank you. Yeah, we've got some questions here. Uh, Okay, so um, I want to hear your opinion on uh, one of the evils of the modern <laughs> uh, government systems and the economy, which I think is the central bank. Uh, what is your stance on central banking and uh, what's your stance also on the cryptocurrency and if it really alleviates those problems? Yes, yeah, so the question is what's my stance on central banking and on cryptocurrencies? So a uh, stance on central banking is pretty easy. It's, uh, central banking is just another form of central planning. Uh, it's the, it's the uh, most impactful form of central planning because the most important uh, economic uh, tool that we have is money. Money is the way in which we interact. Money is the way in which we trade. Money is the way in which we place value on things. And what has the government done? They basically created a monopoly and a central plan over money and interest rates. Interest rates, again, are a crucial way, in, in, have a huge impact on all economic transactions. You can see right now we've got inflation. Inflation, why? Why do we have inflation today? Because somebody decided to print more money than the rise in productivity. Some central planner decided that, right? And you get inflation. You always get inflation when that happens. But that's centrally, that's centrally planned money, centrally planned interest rates, centrally planned economic activity. I'm against central planning of all things. I'm solely against central planning of money. There's no reason to have it. We, 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 we can easily have private money. We've had private money in our past. In America, you used to get these uh, dollar bills and the dollar bills issued by the Bank of New York or issued by the Bank of Mississippi or I don't know, some little town somewhere. Because banks issued money. What did they have in their vaults to justify the issue of paper money? They had gold. Because in those days, what the market evolved was a gold standard. But I don't really care what the standard is. It could be anything. But then you have competition, and the best money wins, just like in everything else. So uh, I'm a big believer in freedom. And that doesn't end when it comes to money. I think central banking is a perversion and distortion. And I think the history of central banking is pretty bleak. That is pretty bad. If you look at since the establishment of the Federal Reserve in the United States, the economy became more volatile, not less. We got a Great Depression right after the creation, uh, Federal Reserve was created in 1914. Great Depression is 25 years later. Uh, and Almost every economist will agree that it was caused by mistakes by the Federal Reserve. Um, the great financial crisis was caused by the Federal Reserve. I think the uh, inflation we're having right now was caused by the, by the Federal Reserve. So central banking doesn't work. It creates volatility and uncertainty uh, and, and, uh, and, and great problems. Now, is Bitcoin the solution or crypto the solution? I don't know. I have no idea. I, I like competition. I like freedom. And I want different currencies to compete with one another and let the best currency win. 
And if that currency is Bitcoin, great. If that currency is some new currency we haven't even thought of inventing in the crypto space, great. And if that currency turns out to be gold or dollars or whatever, whatever it be, let it win in a competitive market. Uh, so I, I, I am not pro any particular form of money. I am pro freedom when it comes to money, which means competition. Um, okay. <clears throat> so uh, my question is also related to taxation in general. And basically, I'm only talking about the more capitalistic, like Western or Central European countries. Yep. And just to leave aside this like ultra rich tax that the US is planning for like billionaires and top 1% of the 1%. Like even in, I live in for example, Germany and uh, the, there's like this pr progressive tax basically. The more you earn, the more you will end yeah. up paying in terms of the percentage. Yeah. And uh, to me, it just doesn't seem that logical, especially in the capitalistic society because you mentioned during uh, your lecture today that it, you became richer because you produced more or you put more effort or time into it. So it's kind of like conflicting to think that it's disincentivizing you to earn more because you will pay more. And uh, if you could provide, why is it so that it's accepted in a way in the capitalistic worlds, whether through historical background or if you see it kind of regulating in the future in any sort yeah, so of Yes, I guess the question is why do we have progressive taxation? Why are wealthy people taxed at a higher rate than poor people and middle class people? Uh, so why do we have progressive taxation? And, and the reason is everything I said about the attitude against capitalism, right? We believe billionaires become billionaires by taking, right? Giving back, they have to give back because they took. Not by creating. We believe that it's good for them to sacrifice, that sacrifice is a moral ideal, that it's good for them to give more, and that we believe, even in capitalist societies, or relatively capitalist societies today, that central planning is good, and if a government needs more and more and more money, and who has the money? Well, rich people have the money, so we take more of their money. All of those are false. So I think it's immoral and wrong that rich people pay more than everybody else. They became rich by making our lives better. They've already given, quote, back by producing, by creating, by making. Uh, I think the, the best tax system, if we have to have taxes in, in the world in which we live today, is a flat tax. The other thing I think that has to characterize a good tax system is simple. Because one of the things that happens in the world in which we live is that people use all kinds of sophisticated ways to manipulate the government to give them little loopholes, to give them exemptions, to give them ways to deduct this and deduct that. And the more complicated it is, the more people can hide. So flat, simple, everybody should be able to do their taxes on a postcard. And it should be the same rate across everything, uh, a personal, you know, and all the other things. They should never be double taxation. Uh, we have a lot of double taxation in our tax systems. I don't know about Georgia, but in the West, we have a lot of double taxes. Corporations pay taxes, and then there's uh, the dividends are taxed, and then capital gains are taxed. That's all double taxation. So capital gains should be zero, and dividends should be zero if you're taxing corporations. Very close to better you have a better system here, yes. Not ideal, but better. Yeah, I mean, one of, the, one of the amazing things is that Georgia implemented a lot of really good capitalist principles. What is it, 20 years ago, 15 years ago? 15 years ago. And they resulted in the fact that Georgian economy grew dramatically. And yet, it seems like you constantly want to undermine those. You constantly are trying to do away with the good things and bring bigger and bigger, more involved government, uh, which is the trend all over the world, unfortunately. All the things that made us rich, freedom, capitalism, are, are being undermined by status politicians, by statism as an ideal. Uh, and, and to some extent or another, that exists in Georgia. But yes, if you look at the Georgian tax system, at least in its, the way it was conceived, it's as close to the way it should be in, in the kind of world we live in today, it much better than the American tax system, which is horrific. There's double taxation, um, uh, there's distortive, ta 
you know, bad incentives created by taxation. Taxation in America is really, really complicated and bad. Uh, so you have a much better system here. We could learn from you. Is that a question in the back? Somebody's stretching his arm. She has a question. Is that a question? Or are you just waving? No, okay. Uh, but she had a question. Um, uh, you mentioned today that um, we hate capitalism when we actually have no reason to hate it because it gives us freedom uh, to be happy. Uh, and you also said that we should be able to do what we believe is right. Yep. And uh, my question is, uh, with those beliefs, how do you imagine a world where human have, uh, humanity has reached maximum of happiness and freedom by capitalism? It's a good question. So. Uh, I don't think capitalism can guarantee you happiness. All capitalism does is leave you free to pursue happiness. So it's, it's important that in the Declaration of Independence, they talk about the pursuit of happiness. Because who's the only person who can make you happy? Your mother? Mm. No, yourself. myself, yes. Only you can make yourself happy. And a lot of people don't make themselves happy because they make mistakes, because they do stupid things, because they do all kinds of things. But only you can make yourself happy. And all capitalism does is it leaves you free to, to pursue that. How do, I, how do I imagine a world like that? It's, it's hard because we're so far from that world. But it's a world in which governments, and I think uh, you know, governments do very little. They protect us, again, from crooks and criminals. They protect us from invaders. And uh, otherwise, they leave us alone. They, uh, they help us arbitrate disputes. They help define property rights, but they leave us alone. And in a world like that, I imagine uh, also that people, because to get to that world, our ideas would have to change. I imagine people who want to live, and this is the most important thing, right? People who really embrace life, who are excited about living. I mean, I travel a lot all over, all over the world, and I see so many people, particularly young people, depressed. Um, sad, convinced that the world is terrible and that they're living in the worst time in all of human history and that, I don't know, you know Greta, right? Greta's convinced them that the world is going to end in 10 years and we're all going to die. It's not going to end in 10 years. We're not all going to die. Life is fantastic. And your life is the best life from a material perspective than any human being has ever lived on planet Earth. Now, if we were free, I think people would be embracing life, excited about living. I think they would be more entrepreneurial. I think we would have more wealth than we today could even imagine. I think that there would be nobody poor. There would be, I mean, there'd be relative poverty because there'd be inequality. But just do, you can do this exercise at home or you could do it now on your calculators, on your phones. Um, but if you take economic growth, let's say, I don't know, in, in the U.S., um, in the U.S., if you make $30,000 a year, that's pretty, you know, that's pretty poor, right? That's not a lot of money, $30,000 a year. Now, let's say over the next 40 years, we grow the economy and your wages by 2% a year. Then in 40 years, you'll be making... Somebody want to run the, the equation? Okay, it's 1.02 to the 40th times 30,000. I think it's like $80,000 or something like that, $70,000. More, more than double, much more than double, right? That's pretty good. It's less poor. But now, let's assume that the economy grows at 5%, which I think it can if we're free, at least 5%. Now do 1.05 to the 40th times 30,000. Now, it's like almost 10 times. You're making eight point something times what you were. So now, the poorest person, the person who made $30,000, maybe not the poorest, but poor person, is making $240,000. That's pretty good. There's no poverty in the world. If the, if the poor people are making $240,000 a year, there's no poverty. The cure for poverty is not redistribution, because that's zero sum. I, I'd argue it's negative sum. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention about progressive taxation is when we tax the rich a lot, we take more money from the rich, 
What do rich people do with their money? They spend on yachts and houses. Not really. I mean, how many yachts can you have? How many houses can you have? What do rich people really do with their money? What does Elon Musk do with his money? He starts new companies. He invests it. Rich people invest their money. And what is investment? Investment is more economic growth. It's more economic, more jobs, more products, more wealth for all of us. What do, what do middle class and poor people do with their money? They consume it. Is consumption good for economic growth? No. I mean, that's Keynesian. Keynesianism believes that consumption is what drives the economy. But it isn't. Because what happens when you consume the ice cream? It's gone. The essence of cons consumption is destruction. Of course. No, I'm not saying consumption is bad. I'm saying it's not pro-economic growth. Because it's about destroying the stuff. Now it's destroying in order to make your life better. You eat the ice cream. You're having fun. That's good. Right? But the ice cream is gone. Whereas investing is constantly making more ice cream. And think about it. In order to consume, what do you have to do? Where do you get the money in order to produce something? In order to consume something, where do you get the money? If I want to buy ice cream, where do I get the money? You work, so you have to produce. So you have to produce in order to consume, and where does the ice cream come from? Somebody has to produce. So for every act of consumption, there have to be at least two acts of production. What drives an economy is production. What drives production is investment. So I see an economy growing at 5, 6, 7%. I see no poor people. I, I can't imagine how good that is from a material perspective because I'm not a science fiction writer. You would have to be a science fiction writer. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, we've all got little, you know, uh, I don't know, spaceships that take us to Mars for vacations or, or whatever. It's hard to imagine how good life can be. But most importantly, people embracing the opportunity to live the best life that they can live. People embracing their own happiness. People pursuing their own happiness. People excited about being alive and having the potential. That, I think, is the number one feature of a free society. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, at least in its past, America was such a great place to live. It was with people, and people were friendly and nice and generous and benevolent. It was because they were free. And as America becomes less free, people become less nice. Freedom encourages niceness because you value other human beings. Why do you value other human beings? Because they're producing. They're, they're values to you. They're adding to your life. Whereas in socialism, other people are burden on you. The more they consume, the more people are taking... Your stuff is being taken away from you. Socialism is a zero-sum game. I, you know, I, I came from Israel where there's this thing called the kibbutz. Do you know the kibbutz? Kibbutz is like an ideal socialist, communist, voluntary community where everybody has exactly the same. No matter how much you produce, no matter how much you do, everybody gets the same. You don't even raise your own kids. The kid, children are raised together. You don't have a kitchen in your home. Everybody eats at the cafeteria. Everything is communal. And people hate each other. They hate each other. Why do they hate each other? Because some people work hard and some people are lazy. Just a fact of reality. Some people are really smart, some people are not so smart. Yet everybody's equal. But wait a minute, if I'm working hard, why don't I have more? Why is he living off of my effort? And everybody, you know, they backstab each other, they behave really mean to one another. Whereas in societies where people are free to produce and consume based on their own effort, People realize that if he's successful, that's because he's made my life better. So I see a happy, prosperous place. So I don't know if that answers your question, if you had something else in mind. Um, no, I just personally think that creating the world where everyone is free and happy is kind of hard. I mean, I cannot actually imagine that kind of world because everyone is individual, right? And um, my understanding of freedom may be different from someone else's. So but maybe there's only one understanding of freedom. What the difference would be, you might pursue different values than I pursue. Yes, exactly. So but the essence of freedom is that I can't tell you what values to pursue and you can't tell me what values to pursue. We can't force each other. The essence of freedom is no coercion. 
no force. And if you leave people free, they'll produce different things. That's the beauty of it. You might become an artist. I might become a businessman. Somebody else might become a teacher. Somebody else might want to go to Mars. And we'll all do our own thing. And as long as we agree that we're not going to use fists and guns on one another. Yeah, that's what I think is hard. For it humans. is hard. It's yeah, very hard. Because it's hard and that's to why we agree. don't have it. Yes. We don't have it because it's hard. And that's my job is to help convince yes. you that it might be hard, but it's good. And it's worth fighting for and it's worth trying to achieve. But that's hard. Thank you. Yeah. You have to wait for the microphone. And um, I know he re recently purchased Twitter, and of course, the left, the left wing has lost it. And he decided that you know loads of people had decided to, you know, to stop using Twitter and so on and so forth. And I am sick and tired <laughs> of trying to argue that it's not such a bad thing. You know, he had the money, he bought this, and I really would love to hear your opinion on him buying. Um, Twitter, and uh, what would you say in an argument like this? What, what would you say to, I, I'm assuming you would support this because he's investing and this is capitalism and nothing bad. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, so it's interesting because it, it, a lot of the left, people on the left are upset because uh, Elon Musk is buying Twitter. Um, but also people, the people on the right who are upset by him buying Twitter. So. It's not a unanimous agreement. I think it's fantastic. I am so excited by Elon Musk buying Twitter. I think it's the best news we've had in a long time. Why? Because on the right, people for a long time have been complaining about Twitter. They've been complaining about Facebook. They've been, oh, it's dominated by the left. The left controls everything. And, you know, capitalism has failed. The left runs all of it. And what we need is we need government to break up Facebook and to break up, we need, the right has been saying we need government to intervene to save us from, I don't know, you know, from social media. And I, my argument has always been, you don't like Twitter, start your own. Right? You don't like Facebook, start your own. And now there's a better answer. You don't like Twitter, buy it. <laughs> and of course, that's always the beauty of capitalism. The beauty of capitalism is if you don't like how Corporation X is run, Buy it and change it. And if you, you know, in the history of capitalism, particularly in the United States, that has happened over and over and over again. A, a businessman says, I can run that company better than the management of that company can. I can make more money running that company. Okay, prove it. So they go in and they buy up the company. It's called the hostile takeover, what Elon Musk did to Twitter. And then you either make money or you don't. And if you don't make money, you lose your money, and if you make money, cool. You're better than the other managers, you proved your point. But it's, again, it's voluntary. It's, you do, the government does, didn't interfere, the government didn't get involved. So first of all, Twitter's a private company, so Elon Musk buying it, it's still a private company, uh, and it'll do what it'll do, and I'd say to the left what I used to say to the right, you don't like how Elon Musk runs Twitter? Start your own. And second, Elon Musk seems to be committed to what I'd call maximum amount of speech. We'll see if he understands what that means. I'm not convinced. I don't know. We'll see. And if he knows what that's involved. But he seems to be interested in maximum amount of speech, both left and right. So the left has nothing to worry about because they'll be allowed to speak on this platform because that seems to be what he's committed to. And the right's not going to be worried. Now, I still think... He will still moderate it, because I think you need a moderated platform. There's certain things, pornography, other things that you probably don't want on Twitter that you have to moderate out. So we'll see exactly what, but, and, and figuring out exactly the balance of what you want. Do you want Nazis on Twitter? Do you want, I don't know, uh, crazy communists on Twitter? What, what exactly do you want? He'll have to decide. It'll be his company. He'll figure it out. But at the end of the day, if you want to express yourself, Elon Musk seems to be open to a wide platform for Twitter to have a wide array of expression. And the people who are afraid, the people on the left who are complaining, 
They're snowflakes. Snowflakes is a, is a term. You know, so somebody on the right will say something you don't like. I mean, somebody on the left says something I don't like every day. So people on the right say stuff I don't like as well, right? You know, grow a spine, you know, have a personality and say, I don't like what you said, and go on with life. But people seem to fall apart. They seem to completely lose it when somebody says something they don't like. They melt. That's why we call them snowflakes, right? They hear something they don't like and they melt. No. I mean, discussion, debate should be open. It should be, uh, you know, you should be able to hear things that aren't pleasant. Because you know what? Most new truths are upsetting. Most new truths are upsetting. When Galileo said that the you know, earth goes around the sun, not the sun goes around the moon, a lot of people were upset. Catholic Church, uh, a, a lot of people believed it was the other way around. They were very upset. So what? What matters is the truth, not who's upset and who isn't. When Uber launched Uber, a lot of taxi drivers were upset. But it's a better service. It's a tough. So the standard is truth. And the only person who could decide what's true, I mean, reality decides what's true, but for you, you have to decide. No authority can tell you what's true and what's not. At the end of the day, you have to use your mind to figure it out. So, uh, yeah, freedom of expression is what we should be about. And maximizing expression, at least to some extent, uh, is what Twitter should be about. Thanks. Today, so maybe not today, but last decade, the debate between capitalism uh, and socialism has moved to a different, let's say, I don't know, dimension, not comparing, let's say, I don't know, easy case of North Korea yeah. with, I don't know, United States, but saying that they, they, I think the strategy is to blur the boundaries. Yes. And uh, say, okay, look at this Sweden. It's yeah. socialist country, so why socialist bad if, if Sweden is socialist? So, well, I have my answer to that, yeah. but I, I wonder, so what your point would be sure. against such a, I mean, a little bit sophisticated, in brackets, uh, point? Yes, I mean, uh, I mean, first, the fact is that in the world in which we live, there is no capitalist societies. We all live in mixed economies. We have some elements of capitalism or freedom and some elements of state control. We all have central banks, for example. All countries have central banks. Some socialist elements. So all of us lived in mixed economies. Some countries have more freedom and less government involvement. Some have more government involvement and less freedom. But unfortunately, there's no country on planet Earth today that's completely free. That's what I'd like to see. That goes to the point of what would it look like. That would be the ideal. It doesn't exist. So what we have today when we compare countries, except for the North Koreas of the world, which, as you said, are kind of pure socialism, on the capitalism, on the spectrum of different countries, we have all these different mixed economies, mixed combinations. And when you look at a country like Sweden, and to call it socialist is strange. It has socialist elements. It redistributes a lot of wealth. But it has capitalist elements, private property, uh, low, relatively speaking, low levels of regulation, certainly compared to the United States. So you have in Sweden a certain mixture and in the US a certain mixture. And I would say both are bad, because I'd like both to see them more capitalist, more free, growing faster. But to compare Sweden to the United States is really, really hard, because the fact is, Sweden is a smaller country, uh, Sweden is more homogeneous, Sweden has a different mixture of regulations and taxes and welfare than the United States has. It's hard to say, if you look at the Economic Freedom Index, Sweden is not lower than the United States in the Economic Freedom Index. They're both at about the same place. Sweden, Denmark are fairly free countries. The United States is a fairly socialist country, <laughs> right? They're all about the same. All of these Western countries are in the same place, somewhere between, I don't know, 
ranked, I don't know, 6 to 15 on the economic freedom index. The differences are not that big. And even with those small differences, I, I, I would love to run this natural experiment. But, but politicians in America won't do it. I would want open immigration between the United States and Sweden. So Americans can go to Sweden and go to work there open, and Swedes can come to America whenever they want. What do you think the immigration flows would be? I'm pretty sure Swedes would go to America, not the other way around. Indeed, most really entrepreneurial, ambitious Swedes, not most, but a lot of them come to America and go to Silicon Valley and start companies, right? So even, the fa even though there's not big differences, there's still something about America, something about the spirit of it, something about the freedom in certain sectors that still is going to attract the most talented people to it. Uh, people talk about the fact that Sweden life expectancy is higher than the United States. It's really interesting that if you look at Swedish people in America, life expectancy is the same as Swedes in Sweden. The same is true, by the way. I think the oldest people in the world are like Japanese. They live the longest. But if you look at Japanese Americans, people from Japanese heritage who live in America, they live just as long as Japanese in Japan. The problem is that the United States has such a diversity that we have a lot of people who, who, whose life expectancy is, un, is below average. And of course, America unfortunately has a lot of people who don't live optimally for themselves. That is, they don't take care of themselves health-wise. Obesity, bad food, all of that stuff. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a problem comparing countries today because they're all so similar. In, in, in a sense of economic freedom. They're not that different. But even when you do, Americans are significantly richer than Swedes. Uh, I think somebody did a study on, on Denmark, and Danish Americans are like 50% richer than da the people in Denmark. Uh, so we all live in mixed economies. It would be nice if some countries were significantly more free than others. Where is Georgia in the economic freedom index? Uh, uh, close to the top, I think. It's like in the top 10, certainly. I think number one and two used to be Hong Kong and Singapore, but now that China took over Hong Kong, Hong Kong is gone, so it's Singapore, and then I think it's New Zealand um, and uh, Switzerland and countries like that, but Georgia's in the top 10. The United States is not in the top 10. The United States is like 12, and in some surveys, 18. Yeah, the, the problem is that people say that, I mean, look, we are at, at the top, so why are, are we poor then? Because it takes time. Yeah. It takes time to get rich. But, but let me tell you that if you were at the bottom, yeah. you'd be a lot poorer, and you wouldn't become rich. So, and, and being at the, close to the top doesn't mean you're ideal. That is, there's still more freedom. You could be freer, right? You could be even further to the top. You could be better than Singapore. Why is Singapore at the top? Why can't you emulate Singapore? And Singapore is not ideal. Right? In, in the economic freedom, I think 100 is best, and I think Singapore is 80 something. Why not be 90 something in terms of economic freedom? And you'd be richer and freer and happier and more successful. But it's hard to convince people to leave other people alone to be free. People want to impose their views on other people, they want to tell you how to live. Everybody wants to be your mother. And 26 in heritage financial. Oh, okay, so you're not near the top. All right, so you've got a lot of room to improve. Which is, which is below Sweden, which is yes, quite a bit below Sweden. Uh, and I, I'm curious on the other one, if it's higher on the other one, because it's how you measure as well, how you measure these things. But look, you know, the ideal doesn't exist in the world today. Uh, Singapore is great. Economically, it's relatively free. It's not completely free, it's relatively. But don't chew gum in the street in Singapore. You might go to jail, right? So they, they, they try to manage the way you act, uh, you behave, right? So they, they control you socially. They don't. And the ideal is real freedom, where they leave you alone. Any other questions? Uh, firstly, thank you very much. Exciting lecture delivered fantastically, so thank you. Your argument about selfishness and uh, selflessness, right? It's, yep. um, so basically, uh, the, the way we have it now is that selfishness is bad, and we should have it the other way around, right? But there must be some uh, utility to selflessness too, right? Maybe 
maybe uh, more in the past than now, but I mean, selflessness also kind of was quite useful when uh, you know it was kind of channeled to reduce violence, for instance, right? In in the underdeveloped societies in the beginning of the civilization, and then it had it found its way into maybe religion, and that's how we kind of ended up with that moral code that uh, you were talking about. So I don't think it's ever been useful. Um, I think selflessness, what does selflessness mean? It means don't think of yourself. Other people are what matters, you are nothing. Selfless, less of you. Right? I don't think it's ever been useful for you, right? Because the question is, what is the standard? It's been useful to the leader. Like if I'm a tribal leader, if I want to control you, do I want to tell you your life belongs to you and you should do whatever? makes you happy, you should pursue your own values. If I, want to if I want to lead you, if I want to control you, if I want you to do what I say, what am I going to teach you? Not to think for yourself. Rely on me. Let me tell you how to live. So yes, in tribal societies, selflessness was very useful to the tribal leader and to the witch doctor. And they always went together, right? Witch doctors and tribal leaders, they always go together. Why? Do what I tell you. And you go, why should I do what you tell me? And then the witch doctor steps in and says, because he, the gods, say so. And you don't know the world. You don't know truth. And of course, as human beings, back then, we didn't. We didn't understand the world. Why, why did the river go up and down with the tide? Why was there a moon? What did that mean? Why was it half a moon? What, what, what's going on with the sun? Why are seasons changing? Right? So what did we do when we didn't understand any of these things? Because we didn't understand the physical world. What did we do? We gave, we gave each one of them a, a god. Each one became a god. Right? We had a sun god and a moon god and a river god. And everything in nature that we couldn't understand became a god. And the witch doctor would say, well, I can talk to the gods. You can't. Therefore, do what I tell you. Be selfless. And in a sense, that served the utility. The utility of the witch doctor. Yes. So, in fact, what you're saying, and I agree with that, it, there is a kind of confusion of, of uh, terms in some ways. There is no, it's not selflessness, selfishness. Uh, selfishness in itself is, is selfless. It's, uh, uh, I mean, we do um, some things, um, we call it selflessness, but it, in fact it's selfish. You know, that's, that's more like a Mark Twainian take on, on uh, selflessness. I don't know if we've uh, read this. No, so I don't think so because again, you know, basically we're doing something because it's it it makes us feel better. We and we kind of package it as a kind of selfless, yes, selfless but, but act. This, but this is the challenge. The thing is that there are objectively things that make you better, that are good for you, and there are objectively things that are not good for you. And I'd say the number one thing that is good for you objectively is to use your own mind to understand the world and to come to independent conclusions about the world. When a witch doctor or a tribal leader denies you the ability to do that, they are cutting you off from yourself. And they're cutting you off from what's really good for you. Now it could be that, that following their orders feels good. But it can't make you happy because happiness requires independent thought. Happiness requires independent values. Happiness requires independent choices. So there is an objectivity to self-interest. And yes, humanity, I think naturally, because why, is, why did selflessness come first? I think it came first because of our ignorance. Because we come into the world not knowing how the world works. And we struggle to find explanations. And maybe the easiest explanation, the laziest explanation is to accept what this guy says it is. And he, he's, got the, he's got the tribal leader with a gun, you know, with a spear next to him. So it's easier for me just to accept. And then as we evolve as a species and learn more about the world, and importantly learn more about our ability to use our mind to understand the world, we become more independent. 
we become more self-interested. And if you think about it, the first culture that represents that, that's not tribal, that, that where people are self-identifying and making decisions and having values for themselves and where art flourishes is Greece. It's the first human culture in which the individual is elevated and individual thought matters. And it's not an accident that it's the culture that invents the idea of philosophy. It's the first culture that starts asking questions and not answering them because the God said so, but finding natural answers. It's the first scientists, the first philosophers, the first mathematicians. Science and self-interest and moral reasoning go together because you need you need to have confidence in your own ability to reason in order to have confidence in your own ability to pursue your self-interest. So in a tribal society where you're not encouraged, where you're discouraged to think for yourself, you just live but you do what you're told. I suspect there were always self-interested people. They're the people who invented the first weapons, the first tools. They were the first people who invented the first agriculture. And I bet you that what the tribe did to them is burnt them at the stake. We always penalize the innovators, the successful, the people who push us forward because they're exemplars of individualism and the tribal leader and the religious leader don't want them. They don't want exemplars of individualism. They want to suppress it. So my question is about like selfishness and selfishness. Mm, yep. Selflessness. So if I, uh, if, if my selfishness uh, violates other person's self-interest. If my self-interest violates other per person's self-interest, what should I do next? Is it still morally right, or should I give up on my interest in order to respect other person's interest? Well, I mean, you'd have to reason it through, but it's never in your self-interest to violate somebody else's rights. Partially, and here's, here's a, a simple reason why. The simple reason why is that once you accept the idea that it's okay to violate other people's rights, then you basically accept the idea that it's okay to live in a world where violence is legit and where other people are going to inflict violence on you. But if you come to a situation where your self-interest is conflicting with somebody else's, I'd say, Ayn Rand would say, check your premises. Because I think between rational people, there is, no, there is no real such conflicts. Such conflicts don't really exist. Um, my question wasn't about really uh, conflicts and vi viola violation or, you know, don't respect the other people. But, for example, if I want to be um, powerful, like most powerful men in the world, uh, I have to, like, gain power on other people. And if my... You have to what? Like, gain, gain power, I, I, like, on, on the people. Oh, you have to inflict power on other yeah. people. You have to control uh, them, yes. Yeah, like, yes. I want to be but I, them. But I would argue, I would argue it's never in your self-interest. If you properly understand self-interest, it's never in your self-interest to want power over other people. So if you want power over other people, you will never be happy. And all you have to do is look at politicians, and you won't find politicians who are happy. They're miserable, pathetic human beings. I mean, particularly as more status they become. The more status they become, I mean, the ones who go in there like Jefferson and Adams, who want to bring freedom to the world, yeah, they're cool. But once they start inflicting power on other people, they're miserable. Miserable. Just look at the world's leaders today, one after the other. They all look like, I wouldn't want to have, I wouldn't want to have coffee with any one of them. And every time I meet a senator or a congressman in the United States, I leave and say, I, if I never see this person again in my life, that'll be cool. They're not, they're not happy people. Happiness does not come from controlling other people. So there's no case like that, but if, if uh, let's suppose there is No, case but you like can't that. suppose there is, because it goes to the essence of what it means to be human. That is, what it means to be human, it means using your mind to achieve your values. Your mind. Not what you feel, not what you want to make up as good for you, but figuring out what you, as a particular biological entity. So this is why I said... Self-interest is determined objectively, not through whim, not through emotion. So yeah, you can assume. Let's say human beings beca became happy by killing other people. It's just not true. They don't. Now, 
Some people do, psychopaths. Okay, so we keep them out. So all of us, healthy human beings, they're sick, right? So we define sickness as people who achieve some thrill. They're never happy. Psychopaths can't be happy. They achieve a thrill from keep killing other people. That's sick, and we put them in institutions called jails. So if you want, if you desire power for the sake of power, something's wrong with you. Go see a therapist. I mean, I'm Thank serious. You. I'm not kidding, right? I so got it. again, it, values have to be rational and objective and consistent with your being a human being. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not morally right. Well, it's not. It's not morally right for you. I'm for not even you. talking yeah. about how you act to other people. Yep. It's not morally right for you. Thank you. Yep. So I, I wanted to ask you um, about the mimetic crisis of people pursuing their own definition of happiness which has impacted what other people desire. And it's also the fundamental parts of being a human, of wanting the things that other people want. See, I don't think it it's a fundamental be part of being human, wanting what other people want, or what other people have. Um, I really don't. I think, again, I think we're raised in a culture that does not promote individual values and people pursuing individual values. It promotes relative, everything relative. You know, when I see somebody who has much more than I do, I say, good for them. I don't say, I want what they have. And to the extent that I go, ooh, I like the car he's driving. I'd like one of those. It's not that I want his car. It's that I want to go and achieve my value so I can get a car like his, but not his. I don't want to take his away. So, I, you know, I think a healthy human being does not seek what others have. He seeks what he wants, and he defines what he wants based on his own interest, his own nature, his own value system. And it takes work and effort. And one of the sad things in the culture in which we live is we're not taught how to do that. And again, I'd encourage, encourage you guys to read Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand has a book called The Virtue of Selfishness, where she talks about the morality of self-interest and what that means and what that entails and how you go about doing it. But the primary thing is to think for yourself. Ayn Rand's ethics boils down to one virtue. Think. Be rational. It's hard, yes. Did you want to ask? Yeah. Uh, so my question is, uh, uh, is it possible for a monopolistic market to, to exist in a perfectly capitalistic world? Good question. Is it possible for a monopolistic market to exist in a uh, purely capitalist world? And the answer is no. And monopolies are, what sustains monopolies always state um, sanction. Indeed, the first monopolies were what? They were, they were grants by the king to have exclusive right over a market, over a trading market, over a production market. Uh, but in a capitalist market, there's always competition. It might not be obvious what the competition is, but there's always the potential if you don't do a good job of somebody arising up and replacing you. Uh, or, or like Twitter, buying you out and, and changing your business model. But I'll give you a couple of examples. So in the example everybody uses is Standard Oil in the United States, J.D. Rockefeller. Uh, in the 1870s, uh, during the heyday of American capitalism, he had 93% of the oil refining capacity in the United States. Now, that sounds like a monopoly, right? But what do we learn that monopolies do when they have that kind of power? What happens to prices? Prices rise. They go up. And quality goes down. What's interesting is you go back to that period and you look at prices. And prices go down every single year and quality goes up every single year. Why? Why did Rockefeller reduce prices when he had 93% of the oil refining capacity in the United States? Because he knew that if he didn't, somebody would compete with him. He knew if he didn't, that competition would arise. Indeed, one of the things we don't take into account when we do the 93% capacity is the fact that Russia at the time was, uh, it, it, you know, had, had taken Azerbaijan and therefore was, uh, was refining oil produced in Azerbaijan and was considering starting to export the oil to America and compete with J.D. Rockefeller, right? And in a free trade world, it's not even your local market that matters, it's the international market that matters. And then, what did... What did um, uh, what was oil used in those days for? What did they use oil for? 
in 1870s. This is a long time ago. What did people use oil for? There were no cars. So what do we use oil for? Uh, trains. Uh, trains were, they used, uh, they used coal. Yes, right? So what did they use oil for? Lamps. Lamps. Or lighting. Who competed Rockefeller out of the lighting business? He basically went from 93% of the lighting business to zero. Who competed him out of it? Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison. Now, you couldn't see that coming. Nobody, no regulator would have said, oh, it's not a monopoly because Thomas Edison is coming. The beauty of markets is not only are you competing with other people who are finding oil, but you're competing with other people who are creating substitute products that you can't even imagine would replace your product. So again, what you want is maximum freedom. And under maximum freedom, yes, there might be a period in which a company dominates an industry. But if it misbehaves by raising prices un irrationally or by lowering quality, competition will arise and take them out. And even that large percentage will be eroded through competition. So for example, with Rockefeller's case, he had 93% of all oil refining capacity in the 1870s. By 1920s, when, when, when antitrust was filed against them and they were about to break them up, what percentage did he have of the refining capacity in the US? I think it was 23%. All of that because of competition, none of it because of government breaking him up. So no, there are no monopolies for any lengthy period of time in, in capitalism. Thank you. We're good? All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>